This is part one of a two-part Bible study by Ronald L. Dart on the subject, Sacred Names. The problem with the whole subject is that I don't, as far as I can tell, no one has really done a single definitive work on the subject where everything is all pulled together and laid out in a logical order where you can actually deal with the subject. Uh, the, the closest I could come to such a thing is a book or booklet, I guess it's, uh, it's really called The Memorial Name by Jacob O. Meyer. It's sort of in magazine format, and I'm under the impression that it was originally a series of articles rather than having been done initially as a book or booklet. It's 75 pages in magazine format and uh, all crammed with uh, content. There are hardly there are a few pictures or, or plates in it, but for the most part, it's writing. And you have to go right through every step, read every page, uh, analyze every argument, look up the sources, check things that are there so that you don't go off half-cocked. Because the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to go off half-cocked on the subject and not uh, have done my homework and not know whereof I spoke when I actually address the problem. Now, I would like to say, though, at the outset that Jacob O'Meyer does not speak for all the people who hold the sacred name doctrine in one way or another. Uh, there is some difference of opinion among people who hold that doctrine as to how the sacred name should be pronounced, although Jacob O'Meyer says that there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever about the way it should be pronounced. Uh, other people don't agree with him on that particular point. They feel there is some distinction between it. They pronounce, some people pronounce it Yahweh, some people pronounce it Yavah. Uh, some people uh, actually make three syllables out of it. Other people uh, pronounced uh, the name of Jesus in the Hebrew as Yahshua, others as Yeshua. Uh, I'm not sure, frankly, of all of the myriad variations that exist on these, some of these things in the groups because I think, as far as I know, the groups of the Assemblies of Yahweh or the different churches that believe in the sacred name are probably congregationalist in their approach, which means that they do not necessarily ascribe to a, a, a central authority, that no one authority makes their decisions for them. And so you might have some var variation in their beliefs from one local church to another. As I said, lest you think that we were rude, we did convey, convey to the people coming to visit us today, uh, at least to, to the minister earlier in the week, what the subject was going to be, and he felt there would be no problem at all. In fact, I gather there is no, no small amount of interest in the subject on the part of our visitors who are with us here today. So consequently, I decided to go ahead with the sermon, because I, as I said, have been working on it solidly for this period of time. And uh, if any of you uh, have had much experience with public speaking, you know that when you have done the work, and you've plowed through it, and you've got your notes, and you've got that thing together, and you're ready to go. You've got to go. You can't go put it on the back burner and wait till next week. It reminds me of the story Bill Cosby tells about his football coach who had them all in at halftime, and they were behind several points, and he talks about how, now you guys got to go out there and hit them. And they all hollered back, hit them. And then he hollered, go out there and kill. They all hollered back, kill. And he had them all running around punching lockers and tearing up the room. He says, now get out there. And they ran to the door, and the door was locked. <laughs> So I hope you'll all forgive me if I go ahead, since I'm ready today, and talk about the subject of the memorial name Yahweh. Basically what I'm going to do, there are, there are a number of ways you can approach something like this. You can approach it in the abstract. For example, I can pretend that Jacob Olmeyer does not exist. Uh, I can pretend that I've never heard of it, and that I am approaching this subject from a, a, a pure virgin ground. I've never looked at it before. We've gone right in, delved into it. Uh, we're going to approach it from the standpoint of establishing the truth independently of what anybody else says. The problem with that is that you, you, it's almost impossible to really deal in the concrete with the questions that are on people's minds if you approach it from an abstract point of view. And so I decided, no, I won't do that. I will take a thorough, definitive, documented work, and I will address it directly rather than abstractly and concretely. And as I studied through this thing, I, I began to see there was a certain value in it. Uh, in a way, I, my first reaction was, no, I think I'll just do a tape or I'll do an article or I'll, uh, you know, I'll go in the studio and do it. But I thought, no, there is actually some importance in several things that are going to be brought out here today. And I think there's some things about the Bible that you need to know that you don't know and that maybe we have neglected to teach you at times in the past as a very important part of your foundational faith in your Lord and in your Savior. So... I'm going to begin today to uh, go right straight into the, the booklet by the memorial name by Yahweh. By the way, this is a very rare sermon for me. Seeing the Ritz was here, and I'm very glad to see you again, it brought up a certain irony because they were here, or actually over to the other club, the last time I gave this kind of sermon. Now, they're back here today again, and I would like to assure you that this is the only one I've given since that time. 
where I've actually dealt with somebody else's work and had to answer it or tried to answer it point by point. Now, what essentially is at issue in the sacred names question? Now, there may be many questions at issue, but I'm going to deal again today with Jacob O. Meyer's work on the subject. And I'll quote from him, chapter 1, page 1. As we read through the inspired scriptures, we occasionally encounter some rather enigmatic scriptural passages. We may have overlooked them in the past while reading through the scriptures, but suddenly we find ourselves confronted with a puzzling passage. One such passage of scripture is found in Proverbs 30 and verse 4. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in, his garment, or in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if you can tell? One would certainly assume that a regular Bible reader and a student of the Scriptures should know the name of the Almighty and his son, wouldn't you think? However, the writer of Proverbs certainly has asked a legitimate question. What he asks is recorded in the Word for a reason. When we view the broad spectrum of various religions scattered around the world using the Bible as their foundation, we discover that a multitude of different translations of the inspired scriptures are employed. And indeed we do. We find even in individual languages there are, is a bewildering variety of translations even within a single language. Uh, in our own English, you know how many uh, translations there are there or, not, or how many you've seen perhaps yourself. I have eight of my own at home. There are not so many, frankly, in many of the other languages. In France, in French, there really are only two major translations. There are a few other minor works as well, but only two major translations of the scriptures into French. Strangely, however, he says, each one of these different translations uses a totally different name for the Mighty One who inspired the Bible to be written and a different pronunciation for the name of his Son. Now, what you should understand is that what he means by this is that they use a different name from the Hebrew in that Jesus is a different name from the Hebrew Yahshua, is what he means. In other words, he does not see Jesus as a translation or a transliteration as Yahshua. It is a different name. Lord is a different name. Jehovah is a different name. Jesus or Christos in the Greek are different names. Uh, as well as Moffat's the Eternal, he sees as a different name. So when he says they use a totally different name, he doesn't mean that they switch over to Baal or Moloch or uh, or, or uh, Kemosh, he means the names with which you and I are really quite familiar. Why do they all use these names? Why should this be, he says? We must ask ourselves. Certainly this question deserves a logical and reasonable answer. And we who are Bible students must seek the answer. Now, uh, it seems to me to say that we should not substitute translations, and you'll see later he does say that, for the Hebrew original. Now, I, I would presume that it became somewhat offensive uh, to many people who believe as Jacob O'Meyer does because he has published a Bethel edition of the Sacred Scriptures. And essentially, if I, if I understand correctly, it is based on the American Standard Version of 1901, which the basic translation is that translation. But where they have found the names of, of, of uh, things which they would consider offensive in the Bible, such as the term God, which is perceived as a, of pagan origin, the name Jesus, which is perceived of pagan origin, the substitutions are made in there of the Hebrew names for these things that they find, so that it makes a much more comfortable book for people who have a conscience about the use of Jesus or Christ or God or Lord in their translations of the Bible. He continues, The author of this article some years ago was squarely confronted with the question of why the Almighty should have many different names. The question was asked of him, quote, do you know the true revealed name of the Heavenly Father as it is inspired to be written in the Hebrew Scriptures? End quote. Having previously begun a sincere, in-depth study of the Bible, I was already well aware that the name of the Almighty inspired into the Hebrew Scriptures is Yahweh. My reply was phrased accordingly. Then another question followed on the heels of the first. Quote, if you know it, why don't you use it? End quote. Like a bombshell exploding, the facts of the case burst in upon me. Yes, why were we substituting when scholars, educators, historians, and almost every scholarly book on the inspired scriptures contain this name of the Almighty? There is no logical reason for substituting another name for the Heavenly Father. What all one needs to do to prove the veracity of the sacred name is to turn to the Hebrew text. But what if you don't read Hebrew? Now, 
I have a little bit of an education. I'm, I'm a country boy from the hills of Arkansas. I was born just outside the boundaries of Dogpatch. And, but I never in all my life in the process of proceeding and pursuing my education have ever studied Hebrew. And so you could hand me a Hebrew text, and I couldn't even find the divine name in there. I might, by careful comparison of, of, of Hebrew letters with what I could find elsewhere, be able to track it down. So I feel it's a little bit of an oversimplification to say all one needs to do to prove the veracity of the sacred name is to turn to the Hebrew text. But on the other hand, there really is no question about the veracity of the sacred name. Uh, there is a difference of opinion about the pronunciation thereof. But uh, I don't really think there's that much of a case to be made or needs to be a case made about the fact that the Tetragrammaton, as it's oftentimes called, which means four-letter word, uh, the YHVH, as we would transliterate it in English, there really is no question among scholars, even among laymen, uh, people who have read the subject, who have even looked at it at all, have a pretty good feeling for the fact that some version of Yahweh, Yava, Yahweh, Yahash, I mean, uh, Yehovah, uh, or even if a person wants to use the anglicized form, Jehovah, they still have some kind of an idea of the fact that that name is verily true. It is interesting, though, that his response to the question, if you know it, why don't you use it, was as it was. You ever have a situation, this happens occasionally to people, where you are asked a question that absolutely stops you in your tracks. You're absolutely just, you know, your mouth's open. You don't have anything to say. That can be for two, one of two reasons. One, it can be because the question is so profound that you have never thought of it before. Or the other one is that the question can be absurd in the sense that uh, the obvious answer you feel cannot be correct because he wouldn't be answering, asking the question. So you think there must be a catch in this question somewhere. I wonder where the catch is. And so you're stopped in your tracks. But the obvious answer to the question is, if you know it, why don't you use it, is, I speak English. And my audience speaks English. Now, of course, if that question had been asked of me, I could say, well, I do. And I expect many of you have heard me use the, use the name Yahweh uh, or Yahweh uh, in various and sundry. It, happened, it may depend upon which particular mood I'm in at the moment, whether I use the V or the W, because the... Ancient pronunciation was W, the modern pronunciation. Later Hebrew came along with a, a, uh, uh, a V type of pronunciation on that type of construction. But in any case, the ancient, most ancient usage was, as far as I know, Yahweh or Yahweh or something like that. But other people will differ and will say that it should be Yahweh. So you can uh, uh, take your pick, I suppose, as far as that's concerned. You may have to do your own research if you want to determine the difference between the two. So... He makes his, his point as he goes along, but again, as I say, the answer that I would have given right off the bat, and the one he would have to cope with, as far as I personally am concerned, is the reason I don't use it commonly is because I speak English and because my audience speaks English, and I really want them to understand what it is that I am trying to say. Now, another consideration in this area, if you'll turn with me over to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. This is really a little bit of a different subject. Paul is dealing with the speaking in tongues, but he makes a, a, just an interesting point in passing that I think has to be kept in mind when you're talking about this. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. You'll have to pardon me if I'm a little slow today. I have a breeze that I think all of us need uh, on my paper here, so it's a little hard to find. Yep, it blew me over to Romans instead of 1 Corinthians already. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. He says in verse 9, So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue words to be easy to understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification or without meaning. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the sounds, I shall be to him that speaks a barbarian, and he that speaks shall be a barbarian unto me. Now, he goes on to develop his, his thoughts, his concepts in there, but to me this is a very important consideration in the discussion of the use of this name, as Jacob O'Meyer insists, exclusively in the sense that oftentimes if a person has no background, no knowledge regarding the Hebrew names, you will sound like a barbarian to him and communication will not take place. But continuing, on page 2, the sacred name is indeed a controversial subject in religious circles because those who best know the truth of this subject have not submitted themselves to the teachings of the Bible where it is concerned but rather they seek to maintain a theological error. 
Now, I don't think he really means that quite the way it sounds. Because what it seems to say is that those people, whoever those people are, who best know the truth about this, are trying to maintain a theological error, which all of which implies that it is deliberate, that they know, and that it is malicious. Now, I just really can't believe that for a moment. Uh, in fact, the people that I have known who in the past have written about it have done so with a fair amount of success. They have missed the point on a few things that they should have covered and didn't cover. They have advanced information that I thought I think was either well, not well thought out or not well grounded. But I don't feel <clears throat> that it's fair to say that they were trying to maintain a theological error. The unfortunate thing is that Meyer is fond of casting those that disagree with him in this role as you go along, because you'll find him referring, as he goes along, to things like the harshest critics of the sacred name. Now, many times he'll talk about the critics of the sacred name doctrine, and that's fine. There are critics of the sacred name doctrine. But offhand, I really don't know any critics of the sacred name. I really don't know any opponents of the sacred name, and he speaks of people who oppose the sacred name. Now, what, what he means by this essentially is that if you, if you are not in agreement with the use of the Hebrew name, Yahweh, or Yahshua for Jesus, then you are an opponent of the sacred name, as opposed to being an opponent of the doctrine. Now, what you want to always remember when you're reading a work like this, or one by me, or by Ted Armstrong, or by Herbert Armstrong, or by Billy Graham, or by whoever it is, you want to watch for those little things where someone tries to give you a little bit of, what shall we call it, subtle intimidation, where they have this a phrase like the harshest critics of the sacred name. And you say to yourself, well, I don't want to be categorized with or lumped alongside of the harsh critic of the, of the sacred name. I can't be opposed to anything that is sacred. But you see, it has nothing to do with the truth. That argument doesn't. It has nothing to do with fact or evidence. It isn't even good opinion. This is just purely the technique of a debater who uses intimidation to try to put you off balance or to get you to, to take a certain frame of or st stance in your mind rather than simply, carefully walking through the man's case. Now, I will give Jacob Olmeyer credit for one thing. He does state his case, and that's one of the things that I find so frustrating with many of the people uh, whose works I have had to re read or deal with in the past. Because sometimes you have to figure out what in the world the case is. You do not have to figure out the case with his work. He states it convincing, or not convincingly, but clearly. Nevertheless, he says, a strong and most convincing case can be made for the exclusive use of the sacred name in our worship. One need only reject the popular theories of the ministers and educators who have commented on the subject and return to the inspired scriptures to establish what is true. Later, he will say, in, on the same page, it shall be our purpose in this study to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the doctrine of the sacred name is of vital importance to our salvation, because this is what the Bible declares. We shall prove that the correct pronunciation has not been lost, and he concludes that it is Yahweh, but that Satan himself has been at the bottom of a plot to hide and distort the sacred name in worship. The reason for this is plain. If no one knows or calls upon the only name under heaven that offers salvation, no one can be saved. Now, I will give him credit. He does not equivocate. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't uh, hem and haw about it. He comes right out and says that it is essential for salvation unless you know the pronunciation of God's name, unless you do pronounce it correctly, unless you call upon his name in Hebrew, in the sin, what he considers to be, frankly, the primal language or the language that God gave to Adam. Unless you do this, you cannot be saved. And he also, very specifically later on, will say that uh, unless you accept that name, you cannot escape or call upon that name correctly. You cannot escape the great tribulation. Now, what he means by this is that you use the Hebrew names exclusively. You, if that's exclusively of Jesus or God or Lord or uh, Yahweh. Not, I'm sorry, not, not uh, Yahweh, because that's particular to what he's driving at, but the many different variations that you will come across as he would put it, in, in French English, or German Bibles as well. What exactly, though, is the sacred name? I'll use his uh, segment in his book to bring out this particular point because he's by and large uh, correct in his uh, analysis of the incident with God and Moses where God reveals to Moses his name. But it's rather interesting as it goes along. What is his name? Page 13. Moses realized that when he came to the children of Israel, they would ask, Which mighty one? 
Now, by the way, uh, Meyer uses the term mighty one instead of the term God because he feels that the term God is of pagan origin. Uh, mighty one uh, is, is his, what he will use instead of the Hebrew word Elohim, if he, unless he wants to use Elohim directly. So he will either use Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for the mighty one or for God, or he will use this expression in English. They would ask which mighty one or Elohim had given Moses this leadership authority. Moses needed an answer. He needed to have his information directly from the very mouth of the one speaking from the burning bush. It had to be a name that was known to the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a consequence, the speaker who appeared in that burning bush explained his name to Moses. First of all, the mighty being declared to Moses, I am that I am. We're all familiar with that. Uh, the word, I forget the exact phrase, but the words I am come out something like Eheya in Hebrew. He then goes on to say, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, if we stop reading at this point, having read where Moses says to God, what is your name? And he comes back and says, I am that I am. You tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me. Sent, uh, now, what would you think his name was? I think he'd be justified in concluding that it was I am that it was Eheya, as he would pronounce it in Hebrew, but basically which means, I am. Continuing. In the Hebrew, this clause appears this way, and he lays it out in Hebrew, although he doesn't give you the English pronunciation along with it. This means that the Almighty exists because he wills to exist. I should say that, really, most of these things about he exists or the eternal all come out of uh, philosoph the philosophical underpinnings of existence. In other words, the... The most common verb or verbal construction in any language is the verb to be. Basically, it deals with existence. And in the past tense, he was, present tense, he is, in the future, he will be. In the Hebrew, in fact, in all Semitic languages, time is not nearly as important as mood in verbs. And so a, a Hebrew verb can be constructed in such a way that it tends to compass all time. And that is the basic idea of he is, not just that he was. You don't say he was, and you don't just say he will be, because he is now. They basically use the term he is. Although God didn't say that to Moses, he said, I am. Now, this is rather interesting to me, because at this point, as I say, I would have thought he had given his name, and his name was the great I am. But let's read on. He said, he, he defines it as saying, he is, uh, this means that the Almighty exists because he wills to exist. The translated term, I am that I am, is usually defined as I will be what I will be, or I will become what I will become. The verb of existence appears in the first person singular imperfect form. That's all it is, just first person singular of the verb to be. Just as names are explained in various other places throughout the scripture, for example, 1 Samuel 1.20, the Almighty first explains his name for Moses. He explains that he has existed in the past, he has existed now, and he will always exist in the future. Well, not really. Not really. He didn't really explain that because he didn't need to explain that. All he did was to say, I am. Now, the word Eheya, or I am, was very meaningful to Moses. To you and I, it requires explanation, but Moses required none, because he spoke Hebrew, because he recognized the word, and he knew the significance of the word. There was, ex explanation was not necessary, and you can look in your, your, your Bible, and you'll find no explanation was given. To reiterate, this word is derived from the Hebrew verb of existence. This could not be his name. It is merely an explanation of his name. His name follows in verse 15. Well, uh, why couldn't it be? Well, the reason he concludes this, and I, I think by and large I would tend to agree with him, is the fact that as you go on through the rest of the Bible, you don't find people talking about Eheye, you find them talking about Yahweh, or Yahweh, or whatever, however it should be pronounced. So consequently, he is justified in concluding that his name is revealed here in the following verse, but there's a peculiar thing about this name. If you think about it for a moment, it makes a certain amount of sense. Why would God, speaking to Moses of himself, say, He is? He would say, I am, because he is speaking in the first person. He is me, and I, I'm speaking of myself. But then when Moses goes down to the children of Israel, he can't say, I am, because he isn't. It's God that is. He has to then go and use a third person and say, He is. So in effect, we are not dealing with two separate names when we deal with I am and He is. They are nothing more than the, the linguistic variations within a language of the same root word to be. Simple, really, when you stop to think about it. There is no conflict between God saying that his name is I am and his name being he is 
because his name was Hebrew in this context. It fit into a Hebrew context, and it followed the Hebrew rules of grammar. So, why not? I am, if it is God speaking, and he is, if it isn't. And you will recall that Jesus encountered serious trouble on a couple of occasions where he said, before Abraham was, I am. And then another expression where he used the expression, I am. Both of which generated a rather negative response from the people who heard him. Because I am was the name of God. So was Yahweh. He goes on to say, And Elohim said moreover unto Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, Yahweh, Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham and Elohim of Isaac and the Elohim of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Now, of course, if you wanted to be really picky about your approach to this verse, if you, this was all you had, I think I would com conclude that what he said was his name was I Am, and he gets down later, what he is saying is the, the Almighty Existent One sent me. But I don't think that's right. I think that his conclusion that, that Yahweh is the name that is used, and the personal name of God repeated over and over, is quite correct, or another pronunciation of it. The Almighty, in verse 14, has already explained his name, but here his name is placed into the third person form of the verb, Yahweh. This means that his people can call upon him as he who exists, or he is. Uh, he is the object of our worship. He is the one who established our faith. We owe our human existence to him and to him alone, our everlasting existence in a spiritual body also. So the sacred name is Yahweh, or perhaps a, some grammatical variation of the name Yahweh, as revealed to Moses at this particular point in time. Now names, you have to understand, and he brings it out in the book as well, to the Hebrews were extremely important. Frankly, considerably more important than they are to us. We are, and would probably fight for our reputation, and it's quite true that we do get irritated when people pronounce our names, although we don't usually make a big issue out of it if they mispronounce it. Uh, but we don't have the same feeling about names that the Hebrews day. Modern names are used exclusively for designation. They are intended merely for identification. And it is very rare to find a person in our society whose name has meaning in the language that we are speaking. Now, Ronald is not used in our language except as a name, is it? James is not used in our language except as a name. Uh, John uh, is not used any other way. Now, and maybe in some nicknames that some of us apply to certain things it could be, but normally it is not and has no meaning in our name. There are very, very few English names that have any meaning beyond the name as an appellation, a, a tag that we hang on somebody, you know, like a little green tag that he puts on his wrist and carries around and says, I am John, I am James, or I am whoever it is that I am. But in Hebrew, names had meaning. They were used, they were descriptive, often prophetic, and they were sometimes changed, as a matter of fact, because of the, me the meaning of the person was different, and so his name was changed because his name no longer described him. His name was no longer valid. There is no way in our society, that you would ever need to change a name. For your name doesn't describe anything except who you are to people who know who you are. That's all there is to it. So there is no need to do that. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia on the article on name says, Since the scriptures of the Old Testament and New Testament are essentially for the purposes of revelation, and since the Hebrews laid such store by names, we should confidently expect them to make the divine name a medium of revelation of the first importance. People accustomed by long usage to significant character indications in their own names necessarily would regard the names of the deity as expressive of his nature. I buy that. I buy that right down to the ground. And Yahweh did this for the Hebrew people. When they heard the name, it meant something. But Yahweh tells you nothing about God unless somebody interprets it for you. Unless someone interprets it, unless someone explains, the man is, as Paul would put it, a barbarian to you, and all barbarian that was somebody who spoke a different language, and you are a barbarian to him. You are not communicating. So Yahweh, or Yahba, cannot serve the same purpose to an English audience that it served to a Hebrew audience. For the Hebrew audience needed no explanation. It had meaning in their language. It, was, it fit even the rules of their grammar. They knew what you were talking about. But with an English audience, interpretation is absolutely essential.
Now, on page 31 comes the next, I think, very closely related and very important point. He says, as we have already indicated, it is an established fact that the Almighty Father wishes his word to be translated into every known language, but not his name. He has only one name. Now, he says, as we have already indicated, it is an established fact, but I, I have to say, I, I, and maybe I am the one that's at fault, I was unable to, f to find it as an established fact prior to this point in the article that God wishes his name, his word, yes, I know he wants his word to be translated, but I have found no evidence that he did not wish his name to be translated as well. But nevertheless, that's what he says. Not his name. He has only one name. End of quotation. Now, it is true that God's name need not be changed because God never changes. And I think he brings that point out in, the, in, in his article. And as men would do, as Abram, for example, had his name changed to Abraham, as Jacob had his name changed to Israel, uh, circumstances changes, their roles change, who they were changed, their attitude changed, and names got changed. But since God doesn't change, there is absolutely no need for his name to change. The question is, is it possible for a single word in any language on the face of the earth to encompass the meaning and the character and the reputation of the creator of the entire universe, of the great heavenly father, the mighty one of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. How can he be encompassed in one word, one expression? I think you might consider the following. I have a list that I got out of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia of the names used in the Old Testament for the Mighty One of Israel. I'd like for you to listen to the name and the interpretation and tell me which one of them reveals God to you more. Elohim, or the Mighty One, or Mighty Ones, as it should be, because Elohim is plural. Actually, one meaning of El is judge, but the judges were among the Mighty Ones of Israel in olden times. Eloha, or the Mighty One, singular. And many of these are used as El, is used in combination to be strong. It's a combined form which is put in front of other words to talk about the strength and the power of the one described. Adonai, or Lord or Master. Which one of them says the most to you? Which one of them reveals something to you about the one of whom we are speaking? Yahweh, or he is, or as Moffat does, and uh, Jacob O'Meyer said he likes his translation probably the best of any of them, the eternal. Yahweh or the eternal? Which one says the most to you? Tzur, what does that say to you? It means rock, and it is used in the Bible as a name of God. How about Shaddai, or Almighty? Which word says something to a person? Abir, or Mighty One, which is always, by the way, combined with Israel or Jacob, the Mighty One of Jacob, the Mighty One of Israel. El Eloi Israel, the mighty, this is an emphatic putting together of two different words using the word El, which pulls it together into a very emphatic, powerful, mighty one of Israel. Elion, or Most High. Gibor, mighty one, derived from the same root as mighty men, that is, knights or champions. In other words, Gibor is, a, is like my champion, my knight, the one who goes out to defend and to fight for me. Elroy, or, which means the mighty one who sees. Not just, you know, which sometimes is kind of it need to be emphasized that God can see. Because I think sometimes people think he can't. Karik, righteous. Kana, jealous. Because you see back in Exodus 34, 14, it says, Yah, whose name is jealous. So that also is his name. Sabaoth, which is basically used for the Lord of hosts. Eheya, I am. And the list didn't even include Melchizedek, which was another name, because the Old Testament doesn't identify who it is. We're indebted to Paul, though, in Hebrews for telling us that. Now, Meyer is absolutely wrong when he declares that the Almighty has only one name. To be sure, I mean, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia lists 17 in the Old Testament alone. Now, I, I'll admit that some of these are com combinations or they use words, again, that are used elsewhere. But you say, I didn't even get into Yahweh Rofika, God our healer. What, what does it say to you to say Yahweh, Ro Yahweh Rohika or Rofika? But if I say you're eternal healer, I've told you something. I have conveyed meaning about this one. Another one, 
uh, Yahweh Yira, which means, basically means God our banner, or the eternal banner, our banner. It goes on and on. And man has still come short of describing the glory of the Almighty. And as a matter of fact, it was rather interesting to me to realize that, that Meyer apparently found, finds himself somewhat shackled in trying to use Yahweh exclusively because he frequently drops into the English word, the Almighty, which, so that people will know what he's talking about. He has to realize that if he used those names exclusively, his readers who don't have any background in it would find themselves confused and rather lost. And, and well, wait a minute, what, was this, what does this name mean? Is Shaddai or El Shaddai or Yahweh Rofika or uh, what do these names mean? So consequently, he himself has to use that particular phrase, Almighty, as well. Now, he is wrong about all, there only being one name of God. Could he be wrong when he insists that the name may not be translated? I think that's an important question to ask because really it gets down to the bedrock of his doctrine or his approach to this particular doctrine. He says on page 40, without a doubt, where proper nouns are concerned, it is vital that we transliterate them just as every language on this earth transliterates names from one language to another and seeks to bring across the sound of that name. This is the only scholarly and logical approach where the name of the Almighty is concerned. Someone pointed out they thought it would preserve more of the flavor of the Bible if we would transliterate and use names like Yahshua and, and uh, Yahweh and so forth in the Bible. And I said to them, no, I don't really think so. I think if you really wanted to convey the flavor of the Bible, you would translate every name. This would bring you into a totally consistent uh, pattern all the way through the Bible so that you would translate all the names. Because, you see, all of us are fairly familiar with the American Indian practice of naming people. You know, how that you'd have someone who was called White Feather, another one was called Eagle Flying, and you could go on with all the names of, of uh, Indians. All of them had other meanings and were in common use in the language, right? So they are able to express. If you want the flavor of the Hebrew, you should translate the names, not transliterate them. But nevertheless, this is what he feels that should be done. Question. Should the names of God be translated? The New Testament writers freely translated the names from the Old Testament. I think most of us are aware of this, but uh, I've been a little bit shocked sometimes at the things people don't know. Uh, it, somebody has assured me that there are a lot of people, not just a few people, I guess, who are unaware of the fact that the New Testament or the Bible was not written in English. They're like the old lady, I guess, that said if the King James Version was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. And she was not going to allow that Revised Standard Version in her house, said it's worse than the snake. But I think most of us are fully aware of the fact that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew for the most part with one segment in Daniel and in Chaldean, and that the New Testament was written in Greek. At least that's what most of us believe. The interesting side of this thing is that uh, Jacob Meyer does not believe that the New Testament was written originally in Greek. But for, before I get into that, Again, the New Testament writers, the New Testament manuscripts that we have, consistently translate the, the Hebrew names into Greek. Generally, Yahweh comes across as Hokurios, or the Lord. Elohim is usually Theos, or God, with a fair degree of consistency in all of this. Now, here I am. I'm, I'm an attorney in court, and I'm going to call to the stand as my witnesses about whether or not the names can be translated. The Codex Sinaiticus. Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrinus, and the, basically the, the, uh, the primary Byzantine manuscript, which was transmitted or moved over to Byzantium or Constantinople sometime prior to 312 A.D., which was uh, put together by, one of the, by apparently the bishop of, of Antioch in Syria and eventually transmitted across to there. I want to call these as my witnesses. And I want to point out that in each and every one of these texts, I mean, uh, Yahweh is translated as Kurios, or the Lord, which it would be in English, and Elohim is consistently translated as Theos, which translates out again into English as God. And Mr. Meyer has precisely the same objection to Theos in the Greek that he has to God in the English. So we are on the same uh, problem with that. Now, in court, when you get somebody on the stand that absolutely demolishes your case, he just says, no, I translate the name. No, we translated the name. No, we translated it over because it's a thing to do. When you get this person or this, this thing up here who bears witness and it demolishes your case, what do you do on cross-examination? You try to discredit the witness. That's about all you can do when you've got him up there. You've got to prove that he was, he was a liar, 
or that he was in prison sometime born had a record and can't be depended on, or that he's biased in the sense that he's got some axe to grind and he's somehow going to, to uh, uh, mislead you in order to grind his own axe in this particular situation. So you might well ask, I think be justified to ask, what is it then that Mr. Meyer does with the witness of the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that we have in the world today? On page one of a different article, because he didn't, didn't try to address this really in the original one, uh, article is called Exploding the Inspired Greek, Greek New Testament Myth. It was originally copyrighted in 73. I think he revised it subsequent to a wor- uh, good news article uh, that was done that same decade. Uh, he d- revised it subsequently to that to cover some of the things that they covered in the good news article. He says on page one, first of all, let's make it crystal clear that it is the editorial policy of the sacred name broadcaster to affirm that all Holy Scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. We believe this unequivocally and without reservation. The stand taken by the editor is that the New Testament was inspired in Hebrew and Aramaic and subsequently translated by uninspired men into Greek and then into English as into many other languages. We believe that although the original text was inspired, there is no such thing as an inspired translation. Therefore, until such time as the original documents are unearthed, we must base all doctrine on the Old Testament. Now, you think about that for a minute. The original documents were Hebrew or Aramaic. The translations into Greek were uninspired and, in fact, corrupted. And that you cannot depend on the Greek New Testament For doctrine, you must establish all doctrine or base all doctrine on the Old Testament. We should utilize the New Testament, however, and always allow the Old Testament to interpret the New. Yes, we believe that every word of the New Testament was Yahweh breathed in its original Hebrew or Aramaic purity. Of what value to you is a document that was originally perfect that was guaranteed to be God-breathed and inspired in the first place, unless God also guarantees to somehow transmit that inspired document to you. Because, you see, if these men could get in there and change all the names around, they can also delete verses that, 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 that support certain doctrines that are very important. They can also add verses that bring about totally new doctrines and new ideas that God, that Jesus Christ never taught. You have to even begin to call and question the entire Christian religion if our original documents are corrupt and totally undependable. This seems to be what is being implied here. At present, however, because of man's tampering with and corrupting the text, we must research and study to know what he breathed. Well, I would have to say that because human beings transmitted the text, you do indeed have to study and research in order to know for sure what it was that God said or to know what the central message of the New Testament was. Because, indeed, the people who copied it were human beings, and they made mistakes from time to time, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. The dilemma that theologians have been confronted with for over a millennium now is that there exist no original manuscripts of any New Testament books unless they remain undiscovered. Now, I think probably most of you are aware of that, weren't you, that there are no autographs or original manuscripts of the New Testament still in existence? What you may not know is, you may not have thought about is, there are no such manuscripts of the Old Testament either. Another thing you may not realize is that until the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were kind of a sectarian uh, version of the Old Testament, until they were discovered in 1947, as Christians living around around the turn of the century and before, for them, the oldest manuscript of the Old Testament was six hundred years younger than the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament. There were no old manuscripts of the Old Testament. That the Masoretic text, the very oldest ones of it that are in hand-copied manuscript editions, are long since gone. Why? Well, because they destroyed them. Whenever they finished with them, they would copy them out, and the old, worn-out manuscripts were gotten rid of. They didn't want them to be desecrated, so they destroyed them, so they didn't keep them. The traditional practice has been, and the Greek church followed this practice too, I think, in many cases, was to use a manuscript to a certain point, having copied more manuscripts out, but as they became worn, they put them away. 
But oftentimes those script those those were very nearly unreadable and unusable by the time they were put away. And so you can see then already having suffered that much wear and that much time and that much uh, deterioration, that even after storage, the, the likelihood of such a manuscript surviving another 100 or 200 years was really quite remote. And so by and large, only those manuscripts were, were destroyed because they were old and they didn't want them to be desecrated as well. There exist no original manuscripts of any New Testament books unless they remain undiscovered, and I don't expect them to be discovered. The oldest manuscripts extant, with the exception of some Syriac fragments, are Greek. And yet the authors of the New Testament books, in some cases, were incapable of writing in Greek, and in other cases would not have chosen to. Now this is stated without any support whatsoever, and I really have the foggiest idea how he arrived at that conclusion. Uh, there are some things that you really need to know about the Greek language at that time, and I will come to some of it a little bit later as I go along, but the fact of the matter is that the Greek language was the lingua franca of the whole world at this particular time. Alexander had seen to that 300 years before Christ. He had taken the Greek language across into India, as a matter of fact, and because of his conquests and because of his domination, even the commercial language of the Roman Empire was Greek. Oh, they spoke Latin, they did their inscriptions in Latin and all this type of thing, but what did people speak in the marketplace? What did you barter with for eggs or for chicken or for something like that? What did you actually discuss things with and people that you hadn't met before? Greek. Not Attic Greek, not the Greek of Homer and these, these people, Koine Greek. Now, the word, the phrase lingua franca comes from a, a term that was used specifically for a language that was a language of commerce in the Mediterranean many years ago. It was a sort of a, a peculiar amalgamation of, of Italian and French and Spanish and Greek and I think maybe another language, I'm not sure. They were all Latin-based language, and so they had relationships between one another. And as time went on, they picked up words from all over the place. And, of course, with Greek, which preceded the lingua franca by many, many centuries, Greek had picked up words from everywhere as well. Hebrew words, Semitic words, because after all, they had, Alexander had conquered every part of the Semitic world when he went through it. And so in the process, Koine Greek picked up an awful lot of expressions out of that part of the world. It had expressions from Europe. It had Latin expressions probably by the time it got around to the 3rd century A.D. I'm quite sure because it was a, a living language that people used in day-to-day -day conversation. What many people don't seem to realize is that many, much of the population of Galilee in the time that Jesus lived there was Gentile. And the lingua franca of that area would have been Greek. It is really inconceivable that Jesus didn't speak Greek. Not as his first language necessarily, because I have little doubt that his first language was Aramaic, and what he and the disciples discussed around a campfire at night, what language they used, was Aramaic. I have no argument with that whatsoever, for that was the language of Palestine at this time. But it wasn't the language of the areas outside their borders to the north, or of Rome, or of Greece, or of Asia Minor, or of Egypt. If you wanted to talk to people in these areas, what do you suppose the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip spoke in? Aramaic? The man was an Ethiopian. In lingua franca? Greek. Koine Greek, almost certainly. Now, I have no doubt. I would never argue but what Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. I think the evidence for it in the Gospel accounts is quite clear. As his first language, as what he spoke, quote, at home, to use the, uh, the expression many people talk about. But to suggest that the apostles were not capable of writing in Greek, even before the second chapter of Acts really seriously neglects the social situation of the time in which they live. Now, after the second chapter of Acts, after the gift of tongues on Pentecost, it is patently absurd to argue that they could not have spoken and written in Greek in that quite well, isn't it, once they had received the gift of tongues. So the ability of these men to write in Greek is not a question. I have very little doubt they could. And on what earthly basis he can conclude that they would choose not to do so is absolutely beyond me. At a very early date, he says, undoubtedly late in the first century of the Common Era, the New Testament assembly or church became apostatized. Now, I don't really know what his doctrine is regarding the church. I don't know whether he's like uh, Herbert Armstrong, where he feels that the church, the true church, almost just ceased to exist for all practical you know, like Herbert says, for the period of time from the first century until he came on the scene, the gospel of the kingdom of God was not preached. Uh, it's hard for me to ever grapple with that. I don't know whether Mr. Meyer feels that way or not, or whether the, he feels that basically the church just almost got blown out like, a, like blowing out a candle at this point. 
But he says the New Testament assembly became apostatized. The original New Testament writings were translated into Greek, and the original documents were hidden, lost, or destroyed, perhaps intentionally. Now, he doesn't give me any authority for that. And so I, I, it's difficult for me to evaluate why he arrives at this conclusion. I can only conclude that he has come to the place to where in his studies of other things he, he has come to the conclusion that it must have been that way. Therefore, it was that way. Because it couldn't, uh, the, the doctrine could not really make it unless it was. And the truth, that is absolutely correct. The doctrine of the sacred name, as taught by Jacob O'Meyer, cannot stand unless what he is saying here is true. Let's go on. As, we, as he reads it here, he says, uh, Therefore, the purpose of this booklet is to set forth evidence that the books of the New Testament were written originally in Hebrew or Aramaic. If any of these books were written in originally in Greek, which we doubt, I would imagine he would have to doubt it, we maintain that the authors would have retained the true inspired Hebrew names for the Heavenly Father and His Son. Uh, we can substantiate that they realized the vital significance of these names, and that they could not be translated, but in order to maintain sound doctrine and harmony with the Old Testament, they had to be transliterated. In order to confine our study to known facts rather than speculative opinion, the first point we will establish is that there are no original manuscripts of any book or portion of a book of the New Testament extant today. Now, that is absolutely correct. There are no originals extant. But you see, what that means is that there aren't any Hebrew originals extant. You don't have any Greek originals, but you don't have any Hebrews either. You don't have any. And you don't have any Hebrew copies of the Hebrew originals. You don't have any Aramaic copies of Aramaic originals either. They just simply do not exist. He says, all have been lost, hidden, or destroyed. Therefore, the oldest manuscripts available for examination are copies of copies, possibly copies of other copies far removed from the originals, this means that each time they were copied, conceivably there were scribal errors occurring, and indeed that is quite correct. Furthermore, inasmuch as the scribes who did the copying had already deviated from sound doctrine, which is an assumption, that is an assumption, there is the distinct possibility they altered the product to make it conform to time-honored and cherished pagan ideas. Well, that's kind of interesting. Now, it seems to me, I'm not absolutely certain, but it seems to me that, that Meyer believes in the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. By that I mean when he, he, he believes that, that in the Old Testament and then in the original, as he would say, Hebrew versions of the New Testament, that every single word was inspired by God, that he got into the man's mind, he put the words there, that it was God's words, God's vocabulary, God's style, God, what God was saying was breathed through this man. Now, I don't know if Jacob believes this, but I know that many people do. The problem is, as any serious student of the Bible is going to understand, pretty quick it won't hold up. Not in the Old Testament and not in the New Testament. Because the style, the vocabulary, the structure is quite different from one writer of the Old Testament to another. I, you know, I, Isaiah uses words that Ezekiel doesn't use. You know, they are just totally different in their whole approach. And Jeremiah, who would not read Jeremiah and realize how different a man this is from the man who wrote the book of Isaiah? So we've always understood that there is a human element in the Scriptures. There is a divine element and a human element. Many people feel threatened by the idea that there is a human element in the Scriptures. They say, well, if there's a human element in it, how can I, how can I trust? How can I know? I'll come along with that in a moment. I have, I've already asked the question of what value is the divine inspiration of originals without divine preservation and transmission. The fact of the matter is, if somehow or other God did not preserve the message for you and I in a form in which we can get at it, then the original inspiration was of no value to us, perhaps was not even intended for us. One thing you should understand, the transmission of the text of the Bible has always been in the hand of man. Turn over to Romans, the third chapter, if you would. Romans chapter 3. Now, I'm not going to uh, use the saw because uh, Meyer rejects it out of hand, and I would have to say there are some problems with it that uh, God gave it to the Jew, the Old Testament, and he gave the Greek authority to the New Testament, I mean, sorry, to the Greek church. Uh, we'll just lay that aside for the moment. But look what Paul has to say. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. 
But what if some of them didn't believe? Now, he asks here precisely the same question that Jacob Olmeyer is asking in this article. He is saying, what if some of these people had an axe to grind? What if some of these people had some kind of cherished pagan belief that they wanted to hang on to? What if some of these people didn't like some aspect of the law because maybe he wanted to get a divorce and the law said don't do it or don't go back to your original wife and he wants to? What if this scribe wants to change all this type of thing? See, people would look at the scriptures and they'd say, but the Jews kept that and look what people they are. Look what rotten people they would say these Jews are. Paul says, let God be true though every man is a liar. What he's saying is, you can depend on the Old Testament, regardless of the perfidy of the Jews. Okay? So far, so good. The Old Testament was put into the hands of man. And God says you can depend on it. Paul says you can depend on God regardless of the fact that the Old Testament was in the hands of man. question is, if he did that with the Old Testament and preserved it, can we only depend on God to overcome the perfidy of men where the Old Testament is concerned? Can we not depend on him to give us a reliable New Testament as well? As I've already pointed out, there aren't any Hebrew originals. There aren't any manuscripts. There weren't any manuscripts older than the ninth century until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Abs were absolutely dependent, as a matter of fact, on the Masoretes, the mass of the group, a group of people who have preserved the Masoretic text for us, for the accuracy of the Old Testament. Now, I want to go back for a moment here to his Greek New Testament article, uh, page 2, he says, In McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia, we learn under the article New Testament, quote, The original copies seem to have soon perished, emphasis ours. Further along in the same article we read, Partly perhaps owing to the destruction thus caused, but still more from the natural effects of time, no manuscripts of the New Testament of the first three centuries remain. Some of the oldest extant were copied from others which dated from this period, but as yet no one can be placed further back than the time of Constantine, emphasis ours. Still further along in the article we read, quote, history affords no trace of the pure apostolic originals, end quote. Based on this evidence, it should be obvious that any faith based on the so-called, quote, inspired Greek New Testament is a faith not founded upon a solid rock. Now, this may be the most grievous allegation in the entire document, for it destroys faith in the New Testament as the Word of God. Not really it does, because the implication is that the thing was in the hands of man who had the capability of completely and utterly distorting perhaps the most important part of the message of the New Testament. Certainly what Mr. Meyer seems to feel is the most important part. This also may be the most important point he raises in the entire article, or his entire work, because if the New Testament we have is a true record, then the sacred name doctrine, as he teaches it, falls. I'll show you that. Your New Testament uses the Greek terms for Jesus, Christ, God, and Lord, rather than the Hebrew terms. Can Jacob Olmeyer prove that the New Testament was not written in Greek? Can he prove that none of it was written in Greek? For you see, he must, in order to establish his, document, his doctrine. Now, he proceeds in this to begin to attempt to establish certain ideas or points. And I feel I must take you through a few of these so that you understand what it is that he's trying to say as he tries to establish the fact that the originals of the Greek New Testament were not written in Greek, but in some other language. The first point that he makes is an attempted refutation of a largely irrelevant argument about the meaning of the word Hellenist in Acts 6 and verse 1. Actually, he doesn't seem to be trying to prove anything except maybe establish the fact that Greek was not terribly widely spoken among the Jewish people at this time. After that, he makes the point, the language of Yahshua, and for those of you who do not know, Yahshua is the term he uses for Jesus. Talking about the language of Jesus, he says, referring to the time of Yahshua, this is on page 3, Joseph Klausner, Ph.D., states in, 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 on page 263 of his book entitled Jesus of Nazareth, after the reading of the Pentateuch, they concluded with the reading of the prophets, translating orally to the people in Aramaic. This was especially the case in Galilee, where the unlearned were more than in Judea, and where few people spoke Hebrew. For the benefit of those who have not studied languages, allow us to mention that Aramaic is a Semitic language, a dialect of the Hebrew. Now, in the process, all he's doing is trying to establish that Aramaic was spoken by Jesus and the apostles and in this neck of the woods, and I would concede that immediately. However, there is a, an important point to be made here. 
in passing. He says that Aramaic is a Semitic language, a dialect of Hebrew. Unfortunately, Aramaic is not a dialect of Hebrew. Courtenay James in The Language of Palestine shows Hebrew, Phoenician, and Moabite as related languages descended from a language called Western Semitic. East and West Aramaic are branches of the northern branch of North Semitic, a totally different branch of language. Palestinian Aramaic, spoken by Christ, was a branch of West Aramaic. So it was hardly a, a uh, uh, what's, what does the expression he uses, a, uh, a dialect of Hebrew? Because dialects are often close, are much closer. I think what you're dealing with, Aramaic and Hebrew are indeed the same family. They are Semitic languages. But they are no more related. In fact, they are probably less related than French and Spanish. And both languages are branches of Latin. We, those of you who have studied languages are all aware of the fact that Latin fathered a whole uh, group of languages that fell out in different parts of the world from it. French in one area, Spanish in another, Italian in another, and even uh, Portuguese, I believe, which fell out of it as well. So you have quite a a broad spectrum of language. But now Ted speaks Spanish, and I speak some little bit of French, and we can't communicate at all in those languages, even though they are both Latin languages. Hebrew and Aramaic are actually more distantly related than our French and Spanish, as a matter of fact. Otherwise, why did Hebrew need to be translated in the synagogues of these areas if it was so close? It wasn't, as a matter of fact. The reason I felt it important to mention that at this point is because of the assumption that he makes as he goes along and never really establishes that Hebrew was the original language of Adam and has been spoken by God's people down through all generations of time until the time in which you and I now live. In chapter 2, he has a, the type, chapter is entitled, The Scholars Speak. And he has a subheading at the beginning of the first passage of this that rather puzzles me. He says, Scholarship favors Hebrew originals. Now, I would assume from what I read there, that what he is trying to say is that the vast bulk of scholarship has been weighed, I'm going to talk about it right here, actually has concluded that the originals of the New Testament were written in Hebrew. But that is not the case. The vast majority of scholarship has long since concluded that the autographs of the New Testament were all written in Greek. There are still a few diehards around the edges of it who are arguing strenuously about Matthew and Hebrew and maybe Mark about whether or not they were written in Hebrew or Greek and then, I'm sorry, originally and translated. There are still a few who do. But the bulk of scholarship has long since opted or come down clearly on, on the side of Greek originals for the New Testament. I really don't know why he put it there, except that I guess what he means is there is scholarship that or select scholars uh, face, uh, favor Hebrew originals. Now, he says here, there are many excellent points brought forth in favor of the New Testament having been originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic in the book entitled The Quest of the Historical Jesus by the widely known and renowned scholar Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Now, Albert Schweitzer is, is dead, and I've noticed as I've gone along in here that many of his, the scholars that he quotes are, are dead. They are men who wrote back in the 18th century, I'm sorry, the 19th century, or very early in this century, as did Dr. Ch Dr. Charles Cutler, Cutler, Cutler Torrey. Uh, who wrote early in this century, and that there has been a great deal of information discovered since these men's death that probably would change their opinion somewhat. But nevertheless, he quotes him as saying, The fact is that from the language of the New Testament, it is often difficult uh, to make out whether the underlying words are Hebrew or Aramaic. That Yahshua spoke Aramaic, now, that's not what Schweitzer said. That, the Yahshua is inserted in brackets. Schweitzer said that Jesus spoke Aramaic, Meyer has shown by collecting all the Aramaic expressions which occur uh, in his preaching. He considers Abba in Gethsemane decisive, for this means that Yahshua prayed in Aramaic in his hour of bitterest need. Now, that in itself is rather an interesting statement. And he doesn't comment on it, never comes back to it. But he says that in his hour of bitterest need, Jesus prayed in Aramaic. Why not Hebrew? For one of the major points that he's going to make as we go along in here, that it appears that God is, you know, almost always when he communicates with man, communicates with him in Hebrew. And if that is the language that Jesus and the Father speak, why did he speak to him in Aramaic, calling him Abba? Of course, at this time in his life, Jesus had spoken Aramaic almost exclusively for most of the time, but he spoke Hebrew. He had to. He spoke Greek, I'm quite sure, as well. But certainly, his basic language was Aramaic. Now, he continues on. Uh... Actually, well, there are miscellaneous references that, uh, uh, and inferences that are disputed among scholars, as a matter of fact, that suggest that Hebrew or Aramaic originals as you go along. One of the things they point to uh, 
are the Hebraisms that exist in the text. I'm not going to read all these to you because they do get a little bit tiresome, uh, especially in view of the fact that it would take you a lot more, longer than the time that I am going to be here today to go through all of them. But essentially, they talk about the Hebraisms in the text. And you need to bear in mind a couple of things. A person who lived, thought, ate, and breathed Aramaic, even though he spoke Greek and could write Greek, when he sits down to write in Greek, is going to have Hebraisms in his text. Even if his original text is Greek, it's going to have sound like it was written by a Hebrew. So the presence of Hebraisms all by itself is not that critical. But one of the interesting things that has happened in recent years is that some more manuscripts have been discovered in Egypt that uh, date way back. The, one of the reasons that they're being discovered all in Egypt is because it's one of the few places that has a climate where papyrus can survive that long. They begin to find, they find receipts of business dealings, they find commercial contracts, they have found love letters from a man to a woman and so forth, all written in Koine Greek. What they have been shocked to find is that many of the things they thought were Hebraisms that were restricted to the New Testament and, and, and that some writers, some authors had thought indicated maybe it was a translation, they have found in, in commercial contracts and love letters written by people who weren't Hebrew in Egypt. And so the Koine Greek... <laughs> had a number of things that they thought were Hebrew reasons or connected to Hebrew that simply weren't. At least if they were, they were connected in the Koine and they had found their way into the language like a lot of people in English today will use many French expressions like raison d'etre, which means your reason for being. It has a special uh, connotation to it. And we, some of us use it from time to time. Uh, doesn't mean that we did our original work in French, does it? It just simply means that these things have found their way into our language as Hebrew, Hebraisms found their way into Koine Greek. Continuing with the work of Dr. Torrey, he says, In the world of scholarship, a giant in his field is frequently way ahead of his time. Such was the case with Dr. Charles Cutler Torrey. In the early 1900s, he began to espouse the position that the New Testament bears an unmistakable watermark of being a translated document. Dr. Torrey presented his views to the academic community with every available opportunity However, since the traditional viewpoint of New Testament scholars had been that it was written in Greek, Dr. Torrey and his theories were given little credence, nor were they seriously discussed. I think that's an important statement because it really tells you pretty clearly what the status of things were, where everybody was coming from uh, at this particular time. Uh, later, he mentions on page 13, a pilot article along the lines of this was recently published in the Journal of Biblical Literature. Some of you may have seen this one published by Dr. George Howard, of the University of Georgia and entitled The Tetragram in the New Testament. This article explores the exciting possibility that the Tetragrammaton, the four letters of the sacred name in Hebrew, was originally contained in the New Testament text. Well, no, it really doesn't. Uh, I read through uh, Dr. Howard's article there and also a, uh, a sort of an abstract of it that was written in another journal. And what he says, what he deals with, he doesn't deal directly with New Testament texts at all. He's dealing with the appearance of the Tetragrammaton and certain other Aramaic texts and texts of the Old Testament, I think with the Septuagint as well as uh, some other types of targums or what have you of Old Testament documents. He does not deal with New Testament documents. He then speculates at the end of his article that maybe it might turn out to be that somewhere along the line we would find a Greek New Testament that had Hebrew words somewhere in the article. But that is really hardly exploring the possibility that those things exist. He just advanced it as a possibility after having explored the others. He discovered no New Testament manuscripts with such words. He quotes from none. He gives you no concrete evidence to that effect. He is just speculating, is all. Dr. Howard sees a distinct possibility that the name was retained in the first documents of the Greek translation, just as it has been retained in the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. So really there isn't that much there that uh, a person could depend upon. You know, the man has sort of an opinion. I really could hardly consider that as evidence, especially when earlier on he says we're going to stick to the facts in this particular case and not deal with speculative opinion, and this is just plain old speculative opinion, and I think Dr. Howard would be the first one to tell you that's what it was. In fact, that's exactly what he called it, really, in his article. That was an opinion, a theory, an idea that he thought he would toss out for scholars to consider and, and try to deal with along the way. So on it goes. Uh, he cites Josephus on uh, this same page talking about his difficulties with Greek. It's really interesting uh, how that Josephus says, I have taken great pains to obtain the learning of the Greeks and to understand the elements of the Greek language, although I have so long accustomed myself to speak our own tongue that I cannot pronounce Greek with sufficient exactness. All he's say saying is, I have bad accent when I speak Greek. 
I have proposed to myself, for the sake of those who live under the Ro government of the Romans, to translate those books into the, Ro into the Greek tongue, which I formerly composed in the language of our country to send to the upper barbarians. In other words, there was parts of the world that he knew that the works of the Jews wouldn't be read or understood, so he wanted to get them into Greek so they could be understood by, guess who? Barbarians. Not educated people. Barbarians. Because Koine Greek was the commercial language. It was the language of the street. It was a language that was spoken just very nearly everywhere. What he says, what Meyer seems to be doing here I'm not really quite sure what the relevance is of Josephus, except he's trying to say here was a Jew who had trouble with Greek. But uh, that, you know, citing one individual in that kind of a situation doesn't get you very far in uh, trying to prove your point. Later he quotes from another individual, which uh, I think rather strange that this quotation is here, a man named Robert Taylor. He says, the following is an enlightening quote from Robert Taylor's Diegesis, published in 1869. And judging from this date and the content of the quote, I would assume that Taylor is a rationalist. Listen to what he says, quote, It is a false representation, or what would be called in common parlance a lie, upon the title page, where it is represented that the New Testament is, quote, translated out of the original Greek, seeing there never was any original Greek. Notice he doesn't say that, that uh, he said there never was an original Greek. The original of Matthew's Gospel is believed to have been Hebrew. The Epistle to the Romans, and indeed the whole of the New Testament, existed in a barbarous, monkish Latin from which the oldest Greek manuscripts in existence are but barbarous translations. Now, again, he wrote this back in 1869. He was a rationalist. He didn't believe in the Bible, obviously, from his whole approach to the thing. And Meyer doesn't agree with him. For Meyer doesn't believe that the New Testament was translated out of a monkish Latin back into Greek. For that long since has been abandoned as a concept. I mean, the, the discoveries since 1869 have blown that argument to smithereens. No one suggests that the Latin versions of the New Testament preceded the Greek discoveries of the New Testament. He quotes Gibbon at somewhat, some great length about some of the statements of uh, Papias, for example, Irenaeus, uh, Justin Martyr, uh, many of the other of the early church fathers as making statements to the effect that the originals of Hebrews and of Matthew were written in Greek. So here at last, we get to something concrete. We go right straight back to some of the very early church writers who state that the tradition existed in their day, and they're only really a couple of hundred years removed, so they're a lot closer than we are today, and they say that Matthew was written in Hebrew, Hebrews was written in Hebrew. Now, what, what Gibbon does not say, and what Meyer does not say, is that these same ancient authorities say that Matthew and Hebrews were written in Hebrew and translated into Greek. By guess who? Luke. So that they were translated. Now, I don't know if both of them were translated by Luke, but one of them was. What they're saying is they were written in Hebrew and translated into Greek in the lifetime of the apostles, not later. And I have every, and, and basically what I understand from their statements is that they were translated under the supervision of the apostles. And of course, if something was translated from Hebrew into Greek by Luke, I would have to say I had very strong evidence and very authoritative evidence for it. Now, finally, he begins to cite internal evidence in the book of Revelation as to uh, giving the uh, uh, reasons why he feels that it was originally written in the Hebrew language. Now, I think I'm giving you a fair representation along the way of why he feels this, and I know it's a little bit uh, slow and tiring, but it's important because this is what the thing depends on on establishing the fact that these documents that you hold in your hand are not authoritative because they were translated from corrupt Greek as opposed to being really authoritative the words of the, of the apostles and of Christ. He says in, on page 8, as one of the readers of this article, you may be interested in something tangible that you can understand without knowing languages or the technicalities involved. The book of Revelation offers such an area of understanding since it was obviously a translation from Hebrew. First of all, in chapter 5, we see the reference to the book written within and on the backside. This would be a rather awkward way for a scroll to be written, since the book would be safer, in the Hebrew meaning a scroll. Mr. David Einhorn, writing in a New York newspaper in 1956 in an article called Are We in the Days of the Messiah, said, This should have been translated written from right to left. Now, I, I have no idea whether that's true or not. I, he doesn't, I never heard of the gentleman before. I've never seen this anywhere else at any time. I haven't encountered it in the commentary. But let's take it for what it means for a minute, written from right to left. Now ask yourself the question, which languages are written from right to left? The answer would necessity be Hebrew and Aramaic. Right. But it isn't the book of Revelation that is written that way. 
But what John sees in Revelation that is written that way? A scroll. That the scroll is in Hebrew says nothing about the book of Revelation. Then he says we proceed to Revelation 19.16. And he has in his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Ruler of Rulers. He then proceeds to point out how, isn't it a little strange? What do you mean thigh? What's this thing about thigh, this, you know, why thigh? Well, he, he, he proceeds to point out that the Hebrew word for thigh is ragel, and the, the other word, the word for banner is dagel. And he says that it was originally written in Hebrew, and somebody substituted the D for the R, and it came out ragel, which means thigh, instead of dagel banner, which it should have been. Okay. Well, that's now you're getting down to something that maybe you could, could deal with a little bit. But on the other hand, in order for that to be true, there should be no meaning whatsoever to the concept of thigh. Well, I looked in the critical experimental. I haven't checked many commentaries, but the critical experimental absolutely ignored this what altogether, made no reference to it at all, but proceeded to make a very convincing case for the meaning of the word thigh and why it was important. And if you want to look up a couple of scriptures on it, just for your own, I won't turn to them. Genesis 24, 2 and 9, Genesis 47, 29 were both cited by them. They conclude that the word means thigh, and it has to do with the thigh, and that the thigh has significance in this context. I'll leave it to you to study a little bit later. So I really have a hard time with considering that that is proof. Now, I am led to wonder as well why certain other things might not have been dealt with. Take, for example, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, Jesus says. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. If this was written in Hebrew, why is this statement put in there a place that was called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon? That's, it doesn't make any sense uh, to put it that way. If I were trying to describe you, I'd say, well, they met together in a place called Antelope Valley or in a place called Athens over here, you know, in East Texas. If I were in a place called Dallas, I don't have to explain to you that place called in the English tongue Dallas. The Valley of Harmageddon was well known to any Hebrew speaker. There was no need for that expression. And the point was, the book wasn't written in Hebrew. It was written in another language that was necessary to say a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. Now, while we're at it, let's look at some other places in the New Testament that might give us a hint as to what this might mean. Turn back to the book of Hebrews, if you would. Interestingly enough, one of those that are called specifically in question and that the early church fathers felt might have been written in Hebrew to start with. Hebrews chapter 7. And verse 2. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation, king of righteousness, after that king of Salem, also king of peace. What is that by interpretation? Melchizedek. Not a Greek word. It has to then be interpreted for his readers. It wouldn't have to be interpreted for his readers if they were reading it in Hebrew. So, here we have concrete evidence that it wasn't written in Hebrew. Now, maybe it was written in Aramaic, and he has to explain to his Aramaic readers what the Hebrew is, but certainly you could not argue that the thing was written in Hebrew along the way. Turn back a little further now to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9. There are quite a few references like this in the New Testament. I won't by any means turn to all, all of them or try to bore you with them, but I think it's important to really nail down for you the question of you know, what language is the word is written in, if you can see it at all in the, in the Scriptures. In Acts, the ninth chapter, and verse 36, there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is an Aramaic word, which is by interpretation called Dorcas, a Greek word. It doesn't go on and explain to us in English what it means, but the point is he had to actually translate a, a, an Aramaic word or an Aramaic name into Greek. For his reader. Who was his reader? Well, this was addressed to a man named Theophilus, a Greek name. Every indication are that Luke wrote the book of Acts back to front in Greek. And the internal evidence of the book of Acts agrees as we go along. Acts, uh, let's see if I have another reference in Acts. Yes, the fourth chapter. Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is by being interpreted, son of consolation, a Levite, and so forth. In other words, his name meant one thing in Hebrew, it meant something else. Now, this is rather interesting, before we find Tabitha, which is really Aramaic, and we find Barnabas, which is really Hebrew, 
And we have both names have to be translated, so it's really hard to say that this was written in Hebrew or Aramaic. It pretty well had to have been written in Greek. There's no reason, really, to suppose that it was not, when one gets right down to it. John, the ninth chapter, at the risk of uh, boring you. John, chapter 9, and verse 7. And he said to him, this is Jesus speaking, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation, sent. Interesting. The word sent is, is, comes from the Greek root apostello, which means I send, and uh, basically a simple Greek word. But it was necessary for the writer to interpret what Jesus said, because Jesus said it in Aramaic. Go to Siloam, the pool of Siloam, he says, which is by interpretation apostello, or the version of apostello, not exactly that. But I could go on. I mean, there are better than a dozen instances in various New Testament books, both Matthew and Mark and John. All of these have them. And, of course, the book of Acts, written by Luke, has it. Uh, the references in Hebrews by Paul have them. Clear references to the fact that these books were written in Greek. Or, if you want to come down and quite say it was written in Greek, absolute certainty they were not written in Hebrew. And, of course, in Matthew, in the first chapter, Matthew says, speaks that a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, reporting Isaiah, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Hebrew, which means God with us. So I, I, he wasn't writing in Hebrew. Now, the only way you can deal with this is to conclude that not only did the translators take out these names, and not only did they get rid of the old document, but they also inserted all these things as they went along, keeping them in there, which involves such a massive manipulation of the text that uh, it really leaves you with almost nothing to depend on. Coming back to the booklet on the Greek name again, this time to page 10, trying to move along quickly and not take too much time. Page 10, it is also evident that such apostate Jews as philo Judeus were attempting to make the Hebrew religion more palatable for the masses by using different names for the Almighty. Religious superstition is a very compelling force in the lives of people, and most people will not go to the source to check their doctrines. Now, philo Judeus, I believe, was dead about the middle of the first century, so he's not somebody that was very late. He's dealing with something that, according to his allegations, took place very early. If these Jewish apostates were as eager to dilute the true worship as the reference works indicate that they were, simultaneously merging their endeavors with zealous persecution from the developing Roman Catholic Church, no, I'm sorry. The Roman Catholic Church was not developing in the first century. Not as such. The church at Rome did not even come to the ascendancy until after the turn of the century. You find Clement of, Alex, Clement of Rome writing to the Corinthian church right about 95, 97 A.D. and being very meek about the whole thing. He's not assuming authority over them. He's just responding to their letter. He's a very kind person the way he writes to them. The church at Rome has not assumed ascendancy over the other bishops at the turn of the century. In actual fact, that even as Rome began to assume the ascendancy, Rome still did not have control of all the bishops well into the 3rd and 4th century. Keep that in your mind that the church at Rome, which eventually we see as the Roman Catholic Church, really didn't exist that early and as the, quote, Roman Catholic Church that you and I know. All that was was that the bishop of Rome was considered the leading bishop of the Christian world and exercised a considerable amount of power, but not total power over the church. His authority was much disputed by any number of people, including Polycarp and Polycrates. Now, the Roman Church, as I say, was not necessarily there. Every manuscript which could prove, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little too far down, then it is logical that this false pagan worship did indeed seek to destroy any ancient manuscripts which would prove them to be an error. It has not been the true worship which has given us the Greek New Testament. It has come down to us through the corrupted worship of Rome. Is that true? I'll come back to it in a moment. There were no true worshipers in that organization as the documented history of the true religion proves. Now, you're going to have to read Clement's letter yourself and decide if he was a true worshiper of God. Uh, I have an article coming out in the next international news where I go into his letter at great length, uh, and I think you'll find it rather interesting. Every manuscript which would prove Roman area uh, in error was systematically destroyed so that the common people would submit themselves to the doctrines of Rome. With the universal inquisition of the Middle Ages sweeping across Europe, True worshippers may themselves have destroyed some of these precious manuscripts to avert death. I don't know about that. I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe they would under great persecution. Could this scenario he describes here have actually taken place? It's interesting. It's an interesting theory. Could it have taken place? 
All right, there are some things you should know about the preservation and the transmission of the New Testament in order to help you decide whether or not this scenario could have taken place. Number one, the language of the New Testament is Koine Greek. I've already explained that it was the lingua franca of the, of the world from Alexander until Constantine. It is the one language that could travel anywhere. There was a large Gentile population in Galilee. Greek was spoken there. Jesus surely could have spoken Greek. Highly probable that the apostles spoke some Greek even before the gift of tongues. Two, none of the New Testament writers were thinking that their letters would become Scripture. They believed Jesus' return was imminent. They had no thought whatsoever for the preservation of their writings for 2,000 years. Therefore, there was no reason to use expensive vellum as writing materials. They wrote on papyrus, which is very susceptible to climate and to wear, and indeed about the only ancient papyrus fragments of anything we find are found in Egypt. In fact, I think the oldest manuscripts now are fragments of the New Testament date back to the middle of the second century, back to 150, much earlier than we had previously had them, and they were found on papyrus in Egypt. So they used papyrus. Number three, indeed, none of the autographs of the New Testament survive. Because they were written on papyrus, they were transported everywhere from the New Testament church. They were carried about from place to place. They were read. They were handled. They were dealt with. I have very little doubt that they probably eventually fell apart in somebody's hand because of the use that they received. You can imagine it. If you were there, they were read in the churches. They were transported about. The Some of them may have even gone down at sea. It wasn't necessary that the original manuscripts be systematically destroyed, they were worn out in the, by this early church. Number four, the manuscripts were freely copied. Wouldn't you? Let's suppose you attended church in Syria and Antioch, the place where people were first called Christians. And somebody comes through there with the letter of Paul that he wrote to the Thessalonians, beautiful letter, and reads it in church someday. Do you suppose that somebody's going to go on and take that letter to another city that you and some friends might want to say to him, hey, how about hanging around after church today? And you read that to us, and we will all copy it down carefully as you read it so we can keep a copy or more copies of it here. You think you would have done that? Well, you see, there were no printing presses. The only way you could have a book was to copy it. Somebody had to copy it. Why, certainly you would. I would have. I'd have sat up all night with a flickering candle and my eyes about to fall out of their sockets to have written those things out. That was my life. These people were living and dying on this, this sort of thing. They believed in it, and they needed these copies of these manuscripts to give them faith. You bet they copied them. They copied them by the dozens and by the hundreds to the point that over 3,000 manuscripts and fragments survive to this day. How many do you suppose there were prior to the 3rd century? If we got 3,000 of them in our hands right now. Some 3,000 manuscripts or fragments still in existence, cataloged, separated into families. They are related and very easy to tell them. There are three major groups of texts of the Old New Testament. The Byzantine, which was made from a codex that came from Antioch in the early 300s, no later than 312 by most scholars' recommendations. Taken to Byzantium or Constantinople, hence the name Byzantine. The largest bulk of New Testament manuscripts in existence, although not the oldest, are all in the Byzantine family of texts. The other, another family is Alexandrian text, which includes Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and Sinaiticus. They are among the oldest of the texts, of full texts of the New Testament that are available to us. Then there's a group called the Western text, which might be better called all other, because it just basically takes in all the rest of them. They are undisciplined texts with wide variations in them. They are the sort of texts that you would find if you stumbled onto a text here and a text there of people like you and me who did unofficial copies of the New Testament for our own use or of books, I should say, because none of those are really full New Testaments. They are simply individual books and letters, and even parts of those books and letters that people copied out and retained. Certainly they will have errors. I have never myself copied three or four pages of manuscript in my life without making a mistake in the process of writing it all down. I can't write my notes out for the Sabbath service without getting misspelled word in somewhere or making an error. So, the Greek texts contain... Considerable variation. This is one of the things that bothers Jacob O. Meyer. doesn't bother me a bit. Because in all that variation, I see something very interesting. I see clear evidence that no one could corrupt and destroy the New Testament. Oh, sure, you could corrupt one text. I've got you know one sitting here by me, and I'm sitting here copying it out vigorously, and I decide I'm going to change this text that I've got. But what do I do about the one in Alexandria? 
And what do I do about the one in Antioch? And what do I do about the half dozen letters that people have copied out and retained in Corinth? There were hundreds and thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament all over the place. Don't we understand that faking this document would be like faking the Constitution of the United States? How could you do it? It's been printed and printed and distributed all over the place. You could change the original, but the copies still exist. It's beautiful when you stop to think about it. How did God preserve it? God, Paul says, let God be true, though every man is a liar. With all of the efforts to destroy the Bible, the Bible lives. And the good, good news for you, the New Testament lives. And the message is absolutely authoritative for Christians. There is no solid evidence to support the existence of the Hebrew or Aramaic originals of one New Testament book, much less all. Nothing isn't there. And if one New Testament writer wrote one epistle in Greek using the Greek words theos, Jesus, Christos, then the fundamental premises of the sacred name doctrine as Jacob Olmeyer teaches it are false. Now, you know, you look at all this type of thing and you begin to wonder, uh, can the sacred name, continuing with the question, because that's what I've been working on this whole period of time, this last segment, is can the sacred name be translated? Well, you see, what we're left with here is absolute, concrete, irrefutable evidence that it was. 